Hello and welcome everyone. Day one, are you all excited? Okay. Nice. Uh, let me start with the question here. How many data engineers and data architect in the room? Okay, how many of you have hands-on experience with big data applications? Awesome. So this session is going to be very helpful for people who deals with data on a daily basis. Today's focus is going to be on data patterns uh, before we deep dive into the session. Let me introduce myself. My name is Lenin Arivukadal. I'm a senior partner solution architect. Throughout my career, I dealt only with data and databases. I worked with most of the relational and non-relational databases. I'm also a subject matter expert in DynamoDB. I have worked with many customers in architecting their big data applications. Currently, I'm focusing on Gen AI applications and help partners and customer to increase their adoption of using AWS vector databases. With me, I have two co-presenters, my colleague, Vengadesh Periyatambi. He's a principal solution architect and AWS ambassador, Matthew Houghton. He is a data architect in CDL. This is the agenda today. It's packed with valuable insights and discussions. Let's start with modern data strategy and understand its importance in today's landscape. And we'll see various data patterns, and we'll also check how do we implement effective data patterns based on your use case. We'll also address some of the customer challenges in data journey, and we'll look into top-notch partner programs. And at last, on the call to action segment, we will provide you some of steps and resources that you can use to implement modern data strategy effectively. Data has become an integral part in today's information age, right? 90% of the data today are created in the last two years. We are seeing data is also growing zettabytes. It contains value, and also it needs management. So do you think all the organizations are using this data? Only one third of the organization are using this data, and the rest are struggling. And those organizations which are making use of this data improve their business and work on innovations. How do such organizations are making use of data and do data-driven decisions? They also address customer challenges and do a better data management. This is possible by applying modern data strategy. Modern data strategy give you the best practices to manage data. Let's see the end-to-end -end life cycle of modern data strategy. On the left, you are seeing data sources. More the number of data sources, more data will be produced. And modern data strategy uses flexible and cost-effective storage to store the data. They are using purpose-built database solutions, analytics, data lakes, and machine learning to derive valuable insights. They also use governance to create metadata for your data and also uses data governance to store or use the data governance wherever the data is stored. And at the end, the data reaches the end users like people, application, and devices, and then derive valuable insights. Later, the same data is sent back to data sources to improve the customer experience. We have touched upon modern data strategy. Let's check what is data patterns. Data patterns refers to the underlying structures and relationship that exist, that exist within data sets. In the modern data strategy, analyzing these patterns is very vital in understanding your data and making data-driven decisions. How do we do such analysis? How do we migrate your load to AWS to do such analysis? We'll understand various data patterns. But do we have enough materials or resources like run books, technical references, to understand these data patterns? That's what we are going to discuss today. Let's take the pattern one here. How do you migrate transactional analytical workloads on AWS. This is the most frequently asked patterns, I would say. The simple answer could be using migration tools. 
but that's just one part of it, right? There are so many steps involved in it. But before we check it, let's see what are the industries they are using this pattern. Most of the industries that are using this pattern are industry agnostics, and their use cases ranges from using an ERP applications to CRM. And the customer motivation here is to use a perceived low risk of cloud adoption. They all want to move to or migrate to cloud, and then they will think about modernization. Probably their aim is to shut down the data center and move, to, move their application to cloud as soon as possible. And the advantage here, no significant archi archi architectural changes are there. All the refactoring or modernization phase, everything comes later. You can also use their skills, what they're using on their on-prem. For example, if I'm an Oracle DBA or SQL DBA, I can use the same skill set even after migrating my load to AWS. And the technologies used were RDS, Redshift, and QuickSight for visualization, and they also use some of our tools for migrations like DMS, which is our data migration service. Before we check the runbooks and the architectures, let's understand what are the challenges they face with migrations. As you're seeing in the screen here, 94% of organizations say they could be making more informed decisions. And 80% of data migration projects either fail or run over time. There is a famous quote, right? Go for the cause, not for the consequences. So let's understand what are the costs for these challenges. The number of databases, or when the volume of database is high, it's very tough to do a migration process, right? Most of the architect here, data engineers, agree with me. And the cost, cost is a crucial factor. There may be costs involved with the data transfer and also some of the licensing cost. And it also includes some hidden cost that we may not know until we do the migration. Building and deploying scripts, it's also a manual effort. And if you're trying to have a minimum downtime or zero downtime for your applications, it is a very tedious process, and you need to include rollback strategies. Throughout this migration process, maintaining the industry regulatory standards and compliance standards, it's a very tedious process too. So how we can help our organizations or help our customers when they want to migrate to AWS? So that's where we would like to provide you some of the runbooks on architectural reference if the customer or the organization want to move to cloud effectively. Take an example here, and if you're trying to move an Oracle Exadata workload, this is the sequence number of steps will be followed while you're migrating to AWS. This is the runbook that is created by using the same pattern again and again with the same process. As you're seeing here, the step one, starting from functional discovery, and it's going to a DBSC tool. And later, we are using an OLA to understand the licensing requirement and cost. And if you want to upskill your database skill, you can probably go for an Oracle immersion days. And later, you are going to test your architecture and then design by going through a well-architected lens. That is the place you will check how secure my application is, how available and reliable it will be. And then later, you will be migrating data on the applications. The same sequence of steps will be followed on your analytical side as well. You start with the SCT assessment. SCT is a schema conversion tool. So this is the place you will understand, OK, I'm going to migrate my workload from Oracle to Redshift. How is my schema conversion is going to be? And then we'll go to the same sequence of steps from immersion days. And then later, as we have seen on the database side, it's also going to go through a well-architected uh, analytical lens. And at the end, you will be using an IEM guidance, which is a process. It can be called as infrastructure event management. So this is the runbook. You can consider this runbook if you are trying to migrate your load to AWS. And this is the first pattern I'd like to discuss. We have seen the runbook here, but what is the underlying architecture will be? As you're seeing, the application is running query against the traditional databases. We have Amazon RDS, and we have Amazon Aurora. And if you want to improve the latencies, if you want to jump it from microsecond or the millisecond to microsecond, you can use our caching services called Amazon Elastic Cache. And later, you can use some of the migration services like DMS and AWS Glue and also Zero ETL. 
You think like I want to do an analytical processing. You can use our most popular analytical service, Amazon Redshift. And at the end, if you want to have an enriched dashboard, you can use Amazon QuickSight. We have given all the components here, but do we need all the services to be part of the migration? No. As we mentioned, if you want to improve your latency from millisecond to microsecond, you can use caching services. At the same time, you think like all my tables are in Amazon Aurora. I want to move it to Amazon Redshift. So you can use the zero ETL feature alone. You don't have to use any of the DMS and glue services at all. So the materialist view will be directly created in the Amazon Redshift when you populate your data in Amazon Aurora. So these are all the advantages, but I would like to talk about some of the practical uh, migration that has happened. To talk about it, I would like to call my AWS ambassador, Matt. Matt, the stage is yours. Thanks, Lennon. Good morning, Las Vegas. So we've seen the reference architecture here that includes the key AWS services to cover both OLTP and OLAP migrations. But it's important to note that you should pick the services that match the architectural characteristics for the workload that you're actually migrating. So to help us think about this, I'm going to cover a specific case study um, that CDL needed to migrate. We had 600 databases that needed to be migrated from on-premise to AWS. And at the same time, we also wanted to complete a database engine swap from Oracle to Postgres. And all of this needed to be com completed and executed with minimal downtime. Has anybody here used change data capture software before? So yeah, a few. So change data capture, or CDC for short, this was really critical for our migration project. CDC allows you to capture transactions from source databases and then replay them to a target database. The database engine that you are replicating to can also be different from the source. So the architecture that we had for our data mi database migration was firstly an application running in a data center outside of AWS. And this was connected to an Oracle database and running a normal production workload. Change Data Capture software then read the, the database transaction log and replayed these into Amazon RDS Postgres. We were able to keep the two databases in sync whilst maintaining the production workload on premise. The application that we were migrating, we transformed into being container based and we built this in AWS running on the Amazon Elastic Container Service. Then when we were ready to switch over, we stopped the application on premise, we ensured that the databases were in sync, and then we started up the application stack that we'd built in AWS. And this ensured that we had a really quick switch over of the production workload to the AWS cloud. The migration process is something that we had to repeat a lot, so automation for us was key. The change data capture tasks were defined in JSON templates, and then that made each migration config driven. We could just find and replace client specific items like host name and schema names. So at the start of the migration, we locked the Oracle database accounts and then roll back if we needed to was just, an was just a case of unlocking those database accounts and switching back the application endpoint. Now by, de by defining your migration as infrastructure as code like this, you get a number of benefits. First of all, you reduce risk. Automation removes that human element. I'm really not my best doing a manual deployment late at night, for example. At some point, I'm gonna make a mistake. Also, from a testing point of view, it's really important that the environments that you're progressing your application stack through are consistent throughout, and automation gives you that. But you also get speed of deployment, so you can roll out changes quickly through multiple environments and for multiple customers without having to scale up your team. So with the application running in AWS, we continue to use change data capture to replay the transactions from a Postgres database that was optimized for online transaction processing into another RDS instance that we'd optimized for our analytics workloads. 
And we coupled this with additional data storage in S3 and used AWS Glue for ETL and QuickSight for visual analytics. It was in this phase of the migration that we hit, we hit a problem that we had to deal with outside of the automation that we built into the migration process itself. So during the analysis of engine-specific functions uh, as part of our migration, we found an Oracle feature in our analytics solution that had no equivalent in Postgres. And this was fast refresh materialized views. So the analytics solution took about 700 database tables that had been optimized for online transaction processing and then denormalized that data into about 100 materialized views optimized for analytics workloads. We had to build out a fast refresh materialized view capability from scratch. And we worked alongside experts from AWS's database freedom team to deliver this. We've open sourced that project and we continue to maintain it and it's available free to all on CDL's GitHub repo. So this is the architecture for fast refresh views in Postgres. Using database triggers, we capture transactions taking place in the underlying tables that make up our materialized views. And these transactions are stored in additional tables shown here as the materialized view logs. When we want to update a materialized view, instead of running a piece of SQL to completely refresh all of the data in that view, we're able to just bring it up to date by processing only the changes that have taken place since the last refresh. And by using this fast refresh technology, we can achieve a latency as low as about one minute from the original transaction taking place. So today, we're fully running in AWS, but we've done further optimizations to the architecture since the migration. So we have our Java-based applications running in ECS, and within RDS, we've taken advantage of multi-AZ and read replicas. The ability to configure additional resilience and support additional read capacity has been very useful to us. Within RDS, we have our fast refresh module installed. And then we have lake formation, which is providing a central catalog of data of sources held in RDS and S3. And this allows us to use fine-grained access controls right down to a column level. Amazon QuickSight is being used for our, oh, sorry. Go back one. <laughs> so yeah, we're using Amazon QuickSight for data visualization. And QuickSight is able to talk to both RDS and S3. Um, so we're able to take advantage of that additional data we have. Uh, using AWS Glue, we can run further ETL. And we do this to provide curated data marts and data feeds to customers and third party systems. And we also use AWS's transfer family to allow us to easily move data between us and our customers. By combining just a few AWS services like this together, the overall architecture becomes really flexible. And it allows us to cover use cases such as reporting, data feeds, embedded analytics, self-service dashboards, and generative AI. So this brings us back to the topic of modernization of analytics, which Lenin is going to cover in more detail. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Matt. Let's understand the term modernization in AWS perspective. Modernization is basically breaking down the monolithic application into microservice architecture. By doing that, you can accelerate your business innovations and also address the challenges, the technical challenges with your customers. What kind of industry is looking for this modernization pattern? Mostly the industries are agnostics, and use cases, they migrated from their on-prem to AWS, and they, they want to use cloud-native components. And the customer motivation is to here to build a decouple architecture so that they can increase the agility and innovation side of it. An advantage here, they're going to use the best tool for the right use cases, and they're also going to leverage some of our purpose-built database solutions. And technologies used are Aurora to DynamoD on the database side. It also includes analytical and visualization and some of the data integration services. Okay, 
What are the challenges in modernization? Tools. Building the right tool for modernization is a tedious process. And also bringing up the skill set for the new technologies will require a lot of manual effort as well. And data ingestions, if you are going to deal with a high volume of database, data ingestion is also going to be tedious. Data management, most of the applications looking for this modernization are very highly scalable and have a lot of data complexity. People mindset, OK, I was working with the technologies. I'm more comfortable with that. People are always hesitant to move to a newer technologies. Integrations with the new technologies is also a tedious process in this modernization. So when an organization is going to this kind of struggle, how do we help them? Why don't we provide some of the technical guidance that will help them from the scratch till the launch of the applications? Let's get into that. Here the runbook for this pattern. This runbook provides a structural approach to guide the modernization part or the process with the data lake and AML. So in this phase, you are going to find the right tool for the right job, starting from the functional discovery. And take the same example here, Oracle Exadata workload. And if you are moving from uh, on your perm to AWS. So it starts with functional discovery and will go to data solution advisor. This is the place you will decide, do I need to stick to relational database or shall I explore NoSQL technologies? The advice over here is like, if you know that your predefined pattern, access pattern, you can use NoSQL technologies. If you think <clears throat> your application have complex data and joins involved, you can stick to relational database. And you'll do your validation, which is your architectural validations. And after this third phase, you'll go and then check about the sizing of it and costing, and if you want any partner support to implement it. And then later, you will move to well-architected uh, lens, as we have seen in the migration phase. This will architected lens will check your, how secure your application will be, and how available and reliable it will be. And later, this particular pattern is requiring more than what we have seen in migration pattern. It will have application refactoring phase, where you will do application refactoring and check like how I can modernize my application better if there are new use cases being involved. And at the end, you will reach out to the IEM side. And you have seen here, there is an optional phase. You can also build your own data lake and understand if you want to use some of our AAML capabilities. How is the underlying architecture looking like for this modernization data pattern? If you have seen, the application itself is breaking into number of microservice architectures, right? It has the relational and purpose-built databases, and it also have streaming solutions involved. And then it has that integrations layer, which will include AWS DMS and AWS Glue, and will also include some of the big data applications like Amazon EMR. And if you want to uh, do an analytical part of it, you can also use some of the analytical services like Amazon Dripshift, Amazon EMR, and OpenSearch. At the end, we will be using some of the visualization dashboard using Amazon QuickSight. I just want to go through the same flow with an example here. Say, suppose you are going to work with some customer or financial institutions or some of the insurance companies. They would like to migrate and modernize their applications for the mobile banking and many other use cases. So at the time, you don't have to use all the databases or all the analytical services we have given it here. You can use only selected databases. For example, if they're already running DynamoDB, they want to improve the caching, and they want to improve the latencies. They can use Amazon Elastic Cache along with that. I have also worked with um, uh, real estate applications, Zillow, if they want to uh, qu run a query against that databases, which is, is most of it are going to be location-based. So at the time, they can use geo-supported queries databases that Amazon Elastic Cache is going to provide. At the same time, if there is some use cases where we need to do fraud detection, so that time you can use Amazon Neptune. And if you think like, OK, now I have all my services, databases, and analytics. Now I want to explore some of the AML capabilities you can create a data lake using all the data in the S3, and you can use some of our services like Amazon SageMaker and AA services. Nowadays, generative AA is taking a lot of uh, importance. So if you want to use any of the database which has vector support, you can land all your data in S3, as you're seeing in the screen here, and then use some of the vector databases like OpenSearch, 
which has the vector capability to do analysis. Let's get into the next pattern here. And many of the industries are asking for this pattern. How do you decentralize organizational data in AWS? There should be some disadvantages with centralized approach, right? So let's discuss that first. As you have seen in the screen here, most of the domain data is pushed into a one central team. So creating a data expertise in one central team is going to be a challenge. At the same time, if you want to improve the scaling for the new consumer, it's not that easy with the centralized approach. As you have seen in the screen here, only the domain data has been pushed to central team, so few data experts has been given access to play with the data. And tomorrow, if you want to bring a, a data-driven organization, this is a challenge to build a data-driven organization because only few experts has been given access to it. And data governance, there are many cases where you have less data governance, so it's a security issue. And the data is not shared across, or otherwise, you may not have the visibility to see how the data is being accessed. So that also creates lack of data auditability. What is the solution here? Data mesh. Data mesh addresses the challenge in scaling and growing data complexity in modern enterprises. So here are the key aspects of the data mesh concept. So let's go over these keywords one by one. Decentralized approach. So as we have seen earlier, it is only using centralized approach. So only one database team have the access for it. But in the data mesh, the concept here is to decentralize it. And domain ownership. So you are going to provide a data and domain ownership so that the end-to-end -end data lifecycle is managed by the same team. Data is treated as a product, so when you treat that as a product, you can share that product with many parts of the organization. And you have self-service data platform, and finally you have federated governance. Okay, I'm going to decentralize all the data, and that is what going to give me a path to innovation. That will bring chaos, right? So the secret sauce for success here is to use federated approach. Federated approach basically bring the striking a balance between the decentralized data sources and centralized sources as well. What all the industries are using this particular pattern? They are mostly agnostic as we have seen on migration and modernization. The use case here is to use it for large scale analytics and using cloud native components. The customer mo motivation here, they want to reduce the data silos, however they have used earlier with their data. An advantage here, it is going to increase the scaling at the consumer side and also the producer end. And technologies used are Amazon S3, EMR, and IAM. And for visualization, they can use QuickSight and AWS and other data integrations like AWS Glue. GoDaddy is the largest web hosting company. They are facing a lot of challenges the, using the centralized approach. So they want to build an architecture that will avoid these challenges with the centralized approach. So let's see how they have built this architecture. At first, they want to register the data set in the central organization, which is a federated government account. So they will create a catalog, and the catalog is going to create the or populate the metadata for that particular organization. And later, the same catalog is moved back to the producer side, where the data curation, transformation, and enrichment will take place. And the producer or the owner of the business will give a permission to those engineers so that same data catalog will be shared to the consumer side. So once it reaches the consumer side, the consumer also account, the consumer account will also give permissions to some of the consumer personas so that they can run query against this particular data catalog. So they can use some of the services like Redshift or Amazon Athena to query it. So by using this approach, you can see, you can scale the producers at the same time, you can scale the consumer as well. So tomorrow, if GoDaddy is going to get some of the newer use cases, they can simply need to share this particular data catalog only for that particular organization. So the data is treated as a shared product. At the same time, everything is maintained or accessed by using the data uh, governance account. We have seen about how we can use data mesh. Let's understand how you can govern your data better. 
and also some of the other data patterns that are emerging nowadays. To talk about that, let me call my colleague Vengadesh Periyatambi. Hey, oh, thanks, Lenin. Hello, everyone. It's great to be here. So, so far we have seen how to migrate and how to modernize and how to decentralize the data. So the next pattern is how are we going to enforce data governance across your organization? So let's start with the definition of data governance. You may have your own definition for data governance, but in reality, data governance is an approach to ensure your organization's data is in right condition to meet your business objectives and business operations. And in order to meet your data in right conditions, your business and the IT has to have a partnership. So where does this data governance pattern fits? So it is industry agnostic, and the use cases are organization-wide data management. And one of the motivation is to have a centralized balance control and to share and discover the data at scale. So some of the technologies we use is to implement data governance are Amazon Data Zone and AWS Lake Formation. For context, 85% of the companies wants to be data driven, but only 35% are able to achieve that. And if you dig deep into the reasons, is one lack of data strategy or implementation of poor data governance. So historically speaking, data governance is seen as a lockdown measure of your data, where you lock your data in silos, where you're not able to innovate. But in reality, if you have a proper data governance, you should be able to move your data freely across your organization. So since your data is spread across different teams and orgs, it is very hard to discover the data. And you may have a different mechanism for access control. You know, it could be a manual way of requesting and allowing access. And you won't be able to scale across the organization with that approach. And having poor data governance also means you have an increased security risk because of lack of audit control. So if there is a breach, it would be hard to mitigate because you don't have an audit control mechanism there. And also, poor quality of data would lead to inconsistent decision making across your org. So how to build a data governance across your org? Let's take a look at a sample runbook we have developed for data governance use case. So on the left-hand side, just like any other use case, we'll start with business initiatives. So in this case, let's say you want to build a supply chain. And what are my applications and analytic use case that is going to support supply chain? So it could be supply scorecard or inventory. Then in the next phase, what we're going to see is what are the data I would need to build this use case. You know, you don't need all the data at this point, but only the data that you would need to build this particular use case. And you need to figure out who your producers and consumers for this particular business initiatives. And next comes the crucial part, which is the data governance and data management part. So this is where you would ensure you have your data quality, data lifecycle, master data catalog, data catalog, data lineage, and security. And then comes the next phase, which is where your architecture, technology, tooling, and partners. So this is the phase where you will find out like what sort of technology I would need to implement this use case. You know, that could be data lake or data warehouse. And then comes the operating model, and this is where you would have to have a partnership between your team and process to achieve your near uh, goals and the long-term goals before you let the data to be consumed by the consumers. So here is a sample reference architecture. So on the left-hand side, you have two domains. You know, assume they are uh, marketing and you know, the other producer is sales. And on the right-hand side, you have the consumer, and I call them operations. Let's say operation team wants to build or innovate a product based on the data that has been produced by the producers. So for producers, you know, we do have um, multiple uh, services to support the ingestion framework. So as you see on the screen, you do have Amazon Kinesis, Amazon Redshift, and Amazon Glue. Then at the bottom comes the main part, which is the data management. And this is the stage where you would make sure you have your data lifecycle set, starting from the inception to the place where it gets obsolete. Then comes the data lineage, where you're going to track your data or changes of data over time. 
Then comes the data quality, and this is the place where you ensure the quality is achieved so that your consumers can consume the data with trust. And comes the data classification, so this is the place where you want to classify the data so that when there is a business case that arises, you know whom to share the data with. And compliance for security measures. And the main aspect of this reference architecture is the one at the center, which is the federated data governance. And you do have two services, AWS Lake Formation and Amazon Data Zone. So Amazon Data Zone, for example, it has four main components. You have the portal, you have the catalog, you do have the, uh, what's the other one? Yeah. Uh, dun, 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 dun. Okay, so it has the portal, it has the catalog, it has the governance layer. Right, so Amazon Data Zone also lets you grant access to the AWS Lake Formation tables and views so that your data stays at the source, but you should be able to you know, have these assets populated to the Data Zone. And your consumers on the right-hand side should be able to consume the data using the Data Zone. And you, know, you do have Amazon Athena, where you can able to access the data and you have the Redshift query editor to consume the data. And if, let's say, you want to build a machine learning model using the data that you have just consumed, you do have Amazon SageMaker. It does provide you ML governance. For example, you have the model cards, you have the unified dashboard where you can track what's happening. So now you have all the data you need but then how can you improve the customer experience and how can you generate value for the customers using the data that you have? And this is where artificial intelligence and machine learning comes in place. Your traditional artificial learning and machine learning you know, comes where does you know, NLP or forecasting or some kind of processing. Whereas with the recent trend with generative AI applications, we are able to generate images, text, videos, and so on. And if you think of building an effective generative AI application, the key differentiator here is your data. If you think about it, every organization gets hold of the very same foundation model, what you would see. But then what makes this unique is your data. So for building an effective application, you know, your data is going to be the key for this. So let's see where generative AI fits its purpose. So like every other use case, this is industry agnostic. And most of the use cases that we have seen is you know, building chatbots or translational uh, language, data augmentation, and so on. And one of the main motivation is automation and efficiency. And a lot of research and analysis department re relies on our data on generative AI technologies. And we do have a lot of technologies here. But again, I want to highlight some of the technologies we've been seeing with the customers, starting with the vector data store. So we do have Amazon Aurora, OpenSage, and uh, Kendra. Then we do also have Amazon SageMaker and Amazon Bedrock to support this generative AI applications. So a study shows that in 2025, 10% of the data that we're going to consume would be produced by generative AI applications. So this means currently we stand at 1% of the data produced by generative AI. So in the next two years, a lot of the applications or the data that we're going to consume would be produced by generative AI. But the AI, uh, generative AI is evolving, so does the challenges. And the generative AI applications are able to produce highly synthetic fabricated data. So this means you are able to produce misinformation and disinformation, and you can spread fake news, for example. And if, let's say, your input or the model of the data is biased, then the model that you're going to build with that biased data is going to be biased as well. And therefore, the output is going to be biased. And we have seen in the news recently, um, a lot of music videos have been produced by generative AI. So who is going to own the music? So who is going to own the intellectual property rights? You know, these are some of the cha challenges that comes with generative AI pattern. So like I said, you know, to build an effective AI application, your data is going to be the key. So you have four emerging patterns where you could use your data to customize generative AI model. And they broadly falls under three categories. In context, model fine tuning, and training your own model. So in the contextual prompt engineering, what we're going to do is we're going to build or design a prompt which takes implicit information, cues, and data arguments. 
with the retrieval augmented generation, or RAG, as we may call, it can generate and retrieve the data at the same time. And with model fine tuning, what you're going to do is you're going to use a pre-trained model, and you're going to use your existing data, and then you're going to fine tune that model. And the last one is the training model, so where you're going to use your domain-specific data to build your own model. So let's take a look at each pattern in deep. So contextual prompt engineering. So who needs it? So this is for organizations who doesn't want to you know, spend time on coding or resources, but at the same time, they want to leverage LLM assets. So let's say you have two types of prompting with contextual prompt, which is zero-shot prompting and few-shot prompting. So zero-shot prompting, for example, it can be able to give you output without any training uh, needed. Whereas few-shot promptings can be able to give you uh, useful information, but it needs minimal training with few input-output paths. So if we take zero-shot prompting in this example, let's say a user asks that I want to write a bio for my LinkedIn. So what's going to happen here is, based on the user profile data, we're going to retrieve a template, and then we're going to add additional augmentation, again, based on the user profile data. So what we have effectively done is we have context, contextualized the prompt based on user profiles data. And you are able to achieve a customized response for the user in this case. So the next pattern that we see here is retrieval augmented generation. So like I said earlier, RAG is a model where you can retrieve and generate information at the same time. So in this example, let's say you as a company wants to you know, create a finance chatbot where you, know, you want to act this chatbot as a finance recommender. So assume you have all the user information with their pay slips, banking information, spending patterns, investment, stocks, and so on. So on the right-hand side, just like any other organization, you have all the data in the data lake. You're going to take that data, and you're going to pre-process it. But rather than feeding that information into the LLM, what you're going to do is you're going to create embeddings, and you're going to store that embeddings into a vector database. Then on the, right hand, on the left hand side, as an end user, let's say I'm the customer, I want to have some recommendation. So I open up a prompt and I type in some information. And instead of sending that query to the LLM, what I'm going to do is I'm going to again use the very same LLM. I'm going to create embeddings. And I'm going to use that embeddings to find similar embeddings in my vector store. And then once I find it, I'm going to retrieve the information based on the embedding. And then I'm going to pass that context along with the user query to the LLM for a customized response. So what we have effectively done is the training is done on a static model. So that stays as is. But then you have all the you know, information that requires highest privacy level is stored in vector database. So you have built a model that respects privacy, and at the same time, you are able to achieve low hallucinations with generative AI applications. And comes the next pattern, which is fine-tuning, pre-trained models. So this is for the customers. Let's say that I want to build a new model from scratch, but again, I don't have the money, or I don't have the resources, I don't have the time. So what we are going to do is, as you know, a general model is built on unlabeled data using millions and billions of parameters. So we're going to follow an approach here called PIFT, which is uh, in a parameter efficient fine tuning. So instead of focusing on this hundreds of millions of parameter, we're going to focus on only 1% of the parameters that matters to this business. So let's say, again, you want to build a finance industry solution where you have all the data you need. So you're going to pick a model that uh, you're comfortable with. Then you're going to feed that data on the right-hand side into the LLM. So now this LLM is ready, and this is your fine-tuned model. And then when user asks for a question, now this model would be able to produce answers based on your organizational data. 
So this is getting really popular with, among users. And the last pattern with the generative AI is the training large language models. And this is quite popular with medical uh, or research uh, analysis industries. So let's say you are a pharmaceutical industry where you have a lot of data, which you're working on a discovery drug. You have studies, papers, drug results, and so on. And you do not want any bias based on the internet data that's been fed into the model. So what you are going to essentially do is, you have all the data that you need on the right-hand side, and you are going to pick an algorithm from Amazon SageMaker, for example. SageMaker is a service which offers you algorithms of your choice. You could pick an algorithm for your use case, uh, and then you're going to feed all your data into the SageMaker algorithm. Then you want to build a model which would then act as your own base model. So the benefit of having this model is that any input that has been given would be based and would be retrieved based on the data that's been fed into it. So this means this model is not biased because all it has is your very own information, your very own specific domain data. So let's try to wrap up the session by taking a quick look at the components of modern data strategy. So again, for modern data strategy, you may have your own definition. But when we speak with customers, they tend to think technology plays a major factor. But in reality, mindset people and process are equally important, if not more than the technology in itself. So by having a right alignment between all this mindset people, process, and technology, you would be able to achieve and derive more value out of the data. So now we have seen different patterns, starting from migration, modernization, decentralization, and data mesh, governance, generative AI. So whatever use case that you want to build on or whatever data strategy that you may have, AWS provides you with a set of tools that accounts for scale, volume, and variety of data. So these tools goes all the way from ingestion to store, query, and analyze the data. And with that, you can take that data and put into action through services like machine learning, generative AI, and business intelligence. And not only that, we do also have services and solutions to garn and catalog your data. So we have seen run books, we have seen reference architectures, and we sincerely hope that you would be able to produce your run book or at least get some inspirations based on the reference architecture we have shown. So what we would really want you to take away from this session is ideate on your business strategy and find a data strategy to support the business initiatives. Then try to identify the use cases that support these business initiatives and think of data patterns that you may be able to correlate. And if you need any help or if you're unsure, you can work with AWS partners. So we do have you know, hundreds of thousands of partners across 250 regions across the globe. And then try to create a runbook and build repeatable solutions. This way you can accelerate fast. And on the screen, you do have various partner programs. And probably you may be familiar with these programs. But I would like to talk about Data Driven Everything program. So this is a popular program among our partners. So we would work with the customers on a two-day workshop. We work backwards and find the business initiatives. And once we have the business initiative, we would then work on a six to 12 month roadmap. And then what we do is we then pick an MVP use case. We spend another 60 to 90 days to implement to show the success. And then we scale from there. And then for the data migration, we do have DBOLA. So this is, again, for customers who wants to migrate their Oracle workloads to AWS. And so far, we have had 250 plus successful OLA assignments in 2023. And then the next popular one is the directional business use case, or DBC, if you may call. So with this, we have, again, completed 100 plus assignments for customers to, in helping them create a business case for migration and modernizations. So you may take a picture of this program. We are happy to discuss more in detail. 
And with that, we have added some additional resources for you to uh, you know, go and discover after the session. And that takes us to the end of the presentation. And if you could take a minute to finish the survey, we would really appreciate that. And thank you for patiently listening to us. Thank you.